Okay. Okay, so let's start out with a little bit of an overview of what intellectual property um, is and why it is important for artists. Um, intellectual property really is the foundation that protects creative works and brands. Uh, it fosters innovation and it can be passed down from generation to generation like other property, um, but it is intangible. So intellectual property can be kind of a hard thing for people to get their heads around because it's an intangible property, but it is fixed in a tangible form. Um, it may become more valuable in the future if we think about Van Gogh. He did not sell any artworks during his lifetime and then his artwork became very popular and um, is now one of the most well-known artists throughout history. Uh, it does also demonstrate um, ownership. So by registering your work with the US Copyright Office or with one of the other uh, organizations that um, has registration process for things like patents, uh, or trademarks, the USPTO, um, it does demonstrate that you have ownership over that thing that you have created. So that's a really good thing so that people can get in touch with you and license it if they wanna go ahead and license it. Uh, it is personal property, so it can be protected against theft and unauthorized use as well. Here's just an overview of the different types of intellectual property. Uh, so we have copyright, which we're gonna be focusing on today. This protects original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And we'll get into what that means exactly in a second. Uh, we have trademark, which serves to exclusively identify a good or service with a specific company. A lot of people kind of confuse copyright and trademark. Um, the easiest way that I think to explain it is when you're thinking of trademark, you're really thinking of brand names, thinking of Nike, McDonald's, um, uh, you know, Setco, all of those kind of brand names that you see um, or brand product names as well. Whereas copyright, we're really talking about the actual creative work. So a book, a movie, a song, which we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, then we have patents, which protects inventions, systems and processes. We have trade secrets, which protects secret information. The KFC um, recipe is probably a really good example of that um, or Google's algorithm. And then we have, uh, sorry, this last one is supposed to say publicity rights. And so this is kind of a quasi intellectual property and it protects the use of an individual's name, image and likeness from unauthorized commercial use. So you can't just go ahead and use anybody's um, name, image or likeness for commercial purposes in a TV commercial or to promote a product. So let's get into music copyright basics. This is um, a pretty funny quote that I found from Mark Twain. Uh, Only one thing is impossible for God to find any sense in any copyright law on the planet. So that kind of shows you what you have in store. So where does copyright law stem from? Um, it stems from the US cons constitution. And then we also have a federal law um, that sets out all of the provisions relating to copyright. In the US cons constitution, it does state um, that Congress has the right to promote the progress of science and visual arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And then under the federal law, the Copyright Act, we um, have original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression, now known or later developed or otherwise communicated either directly or with the aid of machine or device. So these are kind of the two sources where copyright law stems from. Okay, so copyright is actually automatic as soon as these three things are met. Um, it has to be an original work of authorship, so it can't be copied from somebody else. It has to have a minimal level of creativity. Um, this is really a low threshold for what is defined as creative. Um, I put the Crazy Frog song up there as an example. Um, I don't particularly think that that's maybe um, that creative as of a song, but it was still able to get copyright protection, right? We don't have the US Copyright Office uh, judging um, how creative or how good a work is when it's submitted to them. And then it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. There are a lot of number, number of cases that have helped define what fixed is, and I'm gonna show you some examples um, for music in particular. 
Uh, and then copyright covers these different types of works. So literary works, musical works, which we're going to be focusing on today, um, dramatic works, pantomimes, choreographic works, pictorial, graphic and sculptural works, motion pictures and other audiovisual works, sound recordings and architectural works. So they're kind of the creative works that we're focusing on when we're talking about copyright protection. So in music, there are two copyrights, and this can kind of be confusing, and it's really the key to understanding everything that we're going to talk about um, with the new gram application. Uh, it's really important to understand that uh, within a song, there are two copyrights, typically. So we have the composition, which is the specific arrangement, musical notes, chords, rhythm, harmonies, and lyrics. And then we have the sound recording, which is a totally separate copyright. Um, this is the actual sound recording of the musical composition. So um, often called in the industry, the masters. There can be many masters, um, but there's only going to be one composition. Um, so this is the recording of the composition, but it has a separate copyright and separate copyright protection. So what does fixed mean in the con context of the music industry? Um, when we're talking about the composition side, it's writing lyrics or music on paper or on an electronic device, um, provided it's saved somewhere, so it does have to be saved. Uh, when we're talking about the sound recording, it's the actual recording music in a studio and saving it again digitally or in a physical format. Um, and this is just an example of when we wouldn't have something fixed. So if it was a live performance uh, and it wasn't recorded at all, that's not going to be a fixed expression because there's nothing there to go back to um, and be able to kind of replay or um, look at that particular performance. Of course, if it was recorded, then there would be some copyright in that master recording of the performance. Um, but even when a live performance is performed, even if it's not recorded, there's most likely going to be a copyright in the underlying composition. Uh, so that's the song, the lyrics, most likely that's going to have already been written down somewhere and saved somewhere, unless I guess the artist is just making up the song on the spot. Um, but it, it's typically going to be documented. And so that copyright will exist but there wouldn't be a copyright in that particular live performance unless it is recorded. And if it is, then it's fixed and it has copyright protection. So say we have all of those things. We have um, a creative work, we have an original work, and it's fixed in a tangible um, medium of expression. What exactly do you get when you get a copyright? Um, I like to think of it as a bundle of rights. And so these logs always kind of help me um, think about this. Uh, you're not just getting one right. You have all of the right to do these particular things. So if you are the copyright owner, uh, you have the right to reproduce copies, distribute, perform, display, transmit sound recordings digitally, and prepare derivative works. Um, if anybody does any of those things without the copyright owner's permission, that's where you're potentially going to have an infringement claim. Um, there are some defenses to infringement, such as the fair use defense, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. We're not going to get into what constitutes infringement today or talk about the fair use doctrine. Um, but it is important to know that if somebody is doing these things without your permission, you could potentially have a claim against them under the law. So who exactly owns a music copyright? Um, typically, it's going to be the creator. So the person who actually made the work. When we're talking about the composition copyright, this is typically going to be the songwriter or the composer. Um, and then when we're talking about the sound recording side of it, uh, where typically the creator is going to be the performer on the actual um, master or the producer slash engineer that kind of put that um, master recording together. Typically, however, the producer or the engineer or the studio that's worked on the master, they may assign um, their copyright in um, the work over to the artist or the performing artist or to the label if a label is involved in that situation. We could also have multiple creators, so multiple people who made the work together. If there's nothing in writing to the contrary, um, a work is assumed to be owned equally by anybody that works on it. 
Um, and that's regardless of input. So if you have two people working together on a song and one person only adds a couple of sentence um, to the overall five minute song that's released, it doesn't matter that they only added a small um, lyric, they're still gonna be treated under the law as a 50% owner in that work. Um, the, the law doesn't look at how much was contributed. So it's really important for uh, songwriters and, and people who are working together on, on a work, on a creative work, to make sure that they put something in writing to say who owns what and who's getting what percentage if they don't want it to be 50-50. The other thing with multiple creators is that each of those multiple creators have the right to exploit that work for non-exclusive purposes without getting permission from the other co-writer um, or co-author. And so this is, again, really important for um, creatives to have something in writing if they're collaborating with somebody else, if they don't want to be equally able to go out and, and exploit that work. Um, then they need to be able, they need to have something in writing to that effect to say, okay, only one of us is allowed to go out and exploit it. Um, the other one isn't, um, or they both have to get permission from each other before they do anything with the work. Um, if it's not in there, then non-exclusive purposes, each of them are okay to go out and um, exploit it. As long as they account to the other, right? They, they're still gonna have to give them the uh, their rights, their 50% rights in the work. Then we may also have an employer or a commissioner who actually owns the copyright. Um, this is a work made for hire. And so I'm sure a lot of you have also heard that term. It's kind of notorious, um, I think, in the in creative industries. People um, definitely uh, get a little freaked out when they hear the words word work made for hire, which is understandable, um, because it is essentially the author giving up all of their rights in the copyright to somebody else. And so there's two instances where this can happen. The first one is during employment. So if there is a per individual whose job it is to create jingles for an ad agency, um, and it's within their scope of employment to be doing that, most likely their employer is going to own that ad jingle, not the author who created it. The other example is when we have commissioned works. Um, this isn't automatic. There has to be something in writing that specifically states that it's a work made for hire. And under the Copyright Act, there's only a very limited list of things that actually can be um, types of works that can be considered a work made for hire. Uh, so that's really important to know, um, because sometimes even though there's a group of people calling something a work made for hire, under the law, it may not actually be a work made for hire. And they may need to have included some assignment language in order for that particular work to be um, transferred to that other person. Um, but a work for hire uh, example could be somebody who, um, an, a comp composer who's hired by a production company to come in and create a movie soundtrack. Um, in that particular instance, they're most likely going to sign a work made for hire and audiovisual works are one of the types of works that fall under the work for hire doctrine. And so that most likely would um, hold up and the production company would be the owner in the work rather than the composer. And then we have this last one, which is the assignee. So this is where the, the author is transferring the copyright to somebody else. And this is either by contract or by will. Um, and so a publisher or a label, they're typically going to get ownership and have the artist transfer the copyright over to them. Uh, and then there may be um, a, a wife of a musician who passes away and maybe the copyright transfers to them um, through that uh, musician's will. They're, they're kind of the two prime examples of, of an assignee. So how long exactly does a copyright last for? Um, first of all, when the original Copyright Act was created, the term was only 14 years, plus an option to renew for another 14 years if the creator was still alive after that first 14-year um, term. Uh, over time, this has really been extended longer and longer. Um, in 1998, we had the Copyright Term Extension Act. It's also known as the Sonny Bono or the Mickey Mouse Protection Act. And we now currently have these um, copyright durations. So for a single author, it's the life of the author plus 70 years. For multiple authors, life of the last surviving author plus 70 years. 
for works made for hire, 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation, whichever one is shorter. And then you have that same time frame again for anonymous and pseudo works. Um, so copyright does last for a really long time. Um, and it may be passed down, as I said, through um, somebody's will onto their heirs, or it may be assigned to different people um, throughout the life of the copyright. But essentially after this time period does expire, um, the work falls into the public domain. And once it's in the public domain, anybody is free to use it. Um, there are some different rules uh, if the work was created between nine, uh, before 1976. So just be aware of that. But really any recent works are gonna be subject to this um, copyright duration. Okay, so moving on to copyright registration. Um, another quote I've got here, I don't care what anyone does as long as they go through the copyright office. So a couple of misconceptions. Registration is mandatory. As I said in those first slides, um, copyright protection is actually automatic. You don't need to register your work with the US Copyright Office in order to get a copyright, um, but there are a lot of benefits, which we'll see in a minute, as to why you most likely want to go ahead and register um, the work with the US Copyright Office. Um, but you do automatically have some protection under the law, which is good to know. Uh, poor man's registration. I have a lot of people that come to me and say, oh, I mailed my work to myself. And so I, um, that's how I got a copyright registration. Mailing your work to yourself doesn't give you a copyright registration. Um, it may be used as evidence later down to demonstrate that um, that work was in existence at a particular period of time, but it's not going to actually, you're not actually registering your work by doing that. And then this last one, this one is so, so common. Um, so registration doesn't necessarily mean copyright registration. Um, the PROs, so BMI, ASCAP, um, CSAC, GMR, uh, they, and, and then as well, the publishing administrators, so CD Baby, TuneCore, um, Song Trust, and the um, distributors, they're not typically going to register your work for you. So just because you're registered with one of these organizations, which you should be because that's how you can collect your royalties, but that doesn't mean that they have necessarily gone ahead and registered your work with the US Copyright Office. So it's really important to be aware of because I think a lot of people um, go ahead and they register with these um, organizations, as I said, which they should be doing, but they kind of forget about the, registering their works with the US Copyright Office. So if copyright is automatic, which I said it is, why would you register? Um, there are a lot of benefits of registering with the US Copyright Office. Um, so the first one is that you are demonstrating ownership on the public record. People can go and search uh, for your work and they can find it and they can easily know um, who owns it and contact them if they wanna license it um, or if they just wanna find out who the owner is. It's a really good way of demonstrating um, that ownership aspect. Then this second one is a big one. So uh, recently the law changed and now a work must be registered with the US Copyright Office in order for a lawsuit to be filed. So if you were to find somebody um, or your client found somebody who was infringing on their work, uh, the work must actually be registered before you can go ahead and file that lawsuit. Uh, the issue with this is if it isn't done um, early on um, and you have to wait until it registers, it can be two to 10 months before that registration comes through. So it can really kind of slow down um, the infringement lawsuit process if it hasn't been done before infringement occurs. Uh, the third one is the US Customs Service will protect against importation of bootlegs to some degree. And then this very last one, if the work is registered at least three months before uh, infringement of the work occurs, then the person can elect statutory damages. And so statutory damages are where the plaintiff doesn't have to prove that they lost money or that profit was made. The judge is just going to give um, a number depending on the facts of the case. Um, and for copyright infringement, it's between 230,000 for innocent infringement and up to 150,000 for willful infringement plus attorney's fees and court costs. So this is a huge benefit of registering. Um, 
And, and I think that's why it's it's really so important to go ahead and, and register the works, even though copyright is automatic, having this benefit is really, really important in order to enforce um, enforce your copyrights and go after people if they are actually infringing on your work. Okay, so we have this new GRAM application. Um, it was released by the US Copyright Office just about a month ago now. Uh, and so I wanna go in and define some of the definitions because it's really important to understand these before this application is used. First of all, this application is specifically for albums. Um, and so the way that uh, they have defined albums is a unit of two to 20 songs distributed in physical or digital format or both. Um, and an album does appear to include any group of works released as a collection. So it could be an EP, um, it could be maybe the artist just releases um, five uh, songs um, and they upload them onto Spotify, but they're still kind of contained in a collection that does appear to qualify. So we're not kind of stuck in that traditional definition of an album. Um, there's still a little bit of a question around that, but from the final rule, it does appear that that is the intention um, is that as long as it's a collection, it will be qualified and defined as an album. It also includes artwork, graphics, and liner notes um, on, the, on the sound recording side. Um, the thing with this application is that each copyright must be regist registered separately. So for those of you who have maybe registered a copyright in the past, um, or for the attorneys that, that are in this webinar, unlike the um, standard application uh, or the single author application or the um, group of 10 unpublished works, uh, you can't click the option to register both the sound recording and the musical composition in the same application. They have to be registered separately. Um, so that's kind of, it, you know, it ends up being more expensive um, to register, but there's still a lot of benefits to this registration, um, even though you have to do both sides separately. Uh, okay, so the second thing in order to be eligible for the GRAM application is that the work does have to be published. Um, and so publication occurs when the work is distributed to the public by sale, rental or lease, or when they have been offered for distribution. Um, live performance isn't typically enough. There's going to have to have been some sort of physical or digital um, distribution. If it's on SoundCloud, if it's on Spotify, they're all most likely going to count as publication. Um, the date and the nation of the publication must also be the same for all of the songs. So all of the songs that you're trying to qualify as an album um, have to have been released on the same date and in the same nation. Um, there are some limited exceptions for if the client um, or the artist has released maybe a single previously that's then going to be included again um, on the album. There is a way that you can um, make that known and that is fine. There is an exception for that. But typically, they're all going to have to be packaged and released um, on that same date. So then we're looking at the author. Uh, when we're speaking about the author, we're talking about the individual that created the work or the multiple individuals or entities, uh, or for work for hire, um, the employer or the individuals that commissioned the work. They're actually gonna be treated as the author rather than the creator in that situation. Because remember with work for hire, um, the author is assigning all rights over to the, um, the other person. Uh, the works must all be created by the same author or there must be one common author across all works. So this is dealing with an issue that we had with the standard application where previously you had to go in and you had to kind of bundle where co-writers had, um, had been on particular songs and, and co-written particular songs and then do all separate applications. With this application, there is the possibility as long as there's a common author across all songs um, for different songs to have different co-authors on them or different sound recordings to have different um, co-authors on them. So that's a really, really big benefit of this um, of this gram application um, and was something that, you know, it was specifically uh, kind of created to do. Uh, however, in saying that, the claimant still has to be the same person. So we, you can kind of still run into this issue where um, 
the claimant has to own every single song on that particular album that you're registering. There isn't a way to say, okay, on this song, these two co writers um, are also the co claimants, but then on a separate song, we have a different um, co claimant or individual claimant. There isn't the ability to do that. Um, if that is the case, they either have to get a assignment from the other author um, or assign all of the rights over to somebody else, such as a um, publisher or an LLC. If it's a band, maybe all of the authors assign everything to the LLC. Um, or if they have a label involved on the sound recording side, then they could transfer everything over to the sound, um, to the label who would then be listed as the claimant of everything. But it does have to be all rights um, and there has to be some evidence of that transfer. Uh, so written assignment or inheritance would, would kind of um, count. Um, I just want to point out as well for, for the attorneys that are on this webinar, um, all of the information that I'm speaking about was provided in the final rule. Um, and then also information that the copyright uh, website copyrightgov.gov has put out. Um, Circular 58 is supposed to get released um, soon. It is in the process. And so that's going to provide a lot more information for us in terms of what these actual definitions are and um, let us understand this gram application in a little bit more detail. Okay, so quick overview of eligibility of the GRAM application and exactly what it includes. So there must uh, you must register both sides separately. So we're gonna have one um, registration for the composition, and then we're gonna have one registration for the sound recording. Um, each song is treated as an individual work. And so this is another big benefit of the previous standard application, where in some, um, in some jurisdictions, courts were treating uh, that whole album as one work rather than a group of individual works, which had impact on uh, the damages that were awarded in the event of infringement. So it, they have made it clear in the final rule that each song is going to be treated as an individual work, which is great. Uh, they must be published, but it doesn't have to be physical format. So another thing about the previous um, standard application was that that um, album or unit of publication, as they called it, it had to be physical. Digital did not um, count as part of that application or qualify for that application. Um, you can have different authors on different songs, as I said, provided there's one common author across the whole album. Um, you must have the same claimant for all songs. They must have all exclusive rights in, in everything that's being registered. Uh, it can be co-claimants, that's fine, but it, the, the same people who are the claimant have to own everything. And then we're looking at two to 20 songs um, is what can qualify to be registered. Okay, so having a quick look, um, I put together this little flow chart to kind of help maybe look at the applications that are out there because it is a little bit confusing when you get to the US copyright uh, website and I'm going to pull that up in a minute and talk you through the gram application um, step by step. But there are still these several different applications that are in existence. And so the first thing to really ask um, when you have a client or when you yourself are going to register your work with the US Copyright Office is, is it published or is it unpublished? Um, and so if it is published, we're going to go over here. If it's not published, we're going to go over here. And so if it's unpublished, there is an application for a group of up to 10 unpublished works. Um, it does include both sides. So you could do um, the musical uh, composition and the sound recording within that one um, application for up to 10 unpublished works. With this application, they have to all be the same authors, all the same claimants, less than 10 works, um, but they don't need to be on an album. And so uh, you could have an artist that has unrelated different songs um, and that way they can uh, register it under this particular application group of unpublished works. However, if we're dealing with a published work, uh, we, we have three options um, as, as it kind of stands. And there's really four, but uh, I, think, I think it's three is, three is the better way to look at it. Um, so first of all, if we have an album, two to 20 songs that's published, this new gram application that I'm going to show you is probably going to be um, the best one to use. It is $65 per side. Um, one common author, all the same claimant or claimants, two to 20 songs on the album. 
Then we have a single song. So if you have a client or if you're an artist who's releasing one song, uh, then you can use, and you're the only author and you're the only claimant, then you can use the single work, single author application, which is $45. And again, you can register both sides, which is great. Um, then over here, we have a group of singles. So maybe you have three or four songs that you're putting out, but they're not actually going to be um, released at the same time and included in kind of an album or a collection of works. In that case, the standard application is probably going to be the best one. And you're going to have to unfortunately register all of those individual songs, um, all of those songs individually. Uh, again, $65 per side, um, all same authors, all same claimants, one single song per application in that situation. Um, with this standard application, technically the unit of publication um, application does still exist. However, because of the uncertainty in terms of each song not being treated as an individual work, this new gram application is definitely, um, in my opinion, going to be the better option than using that other standard application. Okay, so how to register a work. Um, and I'm going to show you through the portal in, in one second. But the first step is to go to the copyright.gov website, create an account, log in, input the information related to the work, upload an electronic copy or submit a hard copy if necessary pay the filing fees between $45 and $85 per work, depending on what you're trying to register. And then you sit there and you wait two to 10 months um, for confirmation that the work has actually been registered with the US Copyright Office and accepted. Okay, we're gonna go and have a look now at the actual registration system. While I'm pulling, the, pulling this up, if anybody has questions, um, you can post them in the chat. I think we have one or two here, which I might just um, answer. We have the entire CD liner, do you register as one work and the album slash song cover artwork as a separate work. So with this new grant, good question, with this new gram application on the sound recording side, you can actually register the artwork um, and the liner um, notes as part of that application. So you can do it all in one and upload it um, within that one application, which is uh, super helpful. Of course, if you're doing that, you wanna make sure that you actually own the artwork, right? Because remember that um, whoever created the artwork could still have copyright in their artwork. Then we have Aaron said, how would you register an album where you have one songwriter on six songs and a different songwriter on two songs? Would you have to submit two separate grant applications? Possibly. And so if you have different songwriters, um, you the gram application may be helpful, but at the end of the day, the claimant's still got to be one person. So in that situation, if you didn't have the other songwriter come ahead, come over and assign their copyright to you, um, then you would have to do separate gram applications um, or maybe look at the separate standard application in that situation. So the claimant has to be the same person, um, unfortunately. What if you have an album with more than 20 songs? Uh, you're going to have to go ahead um, and, and probably do that in two separate um, applications, I would say, in that situation. Um, you could still use the unit of publication because that doesn't have a limitation to, to my knowledge. Um, but I think you'd probably still want to go ahead and use the gram just because um, as I said, they're treated as individual works rather than one whole work. Okay, so this is what the copyright.gov uh, website looks like. The very first step is to log in to the Copyright Office registration system. Um, okay. If we can log in, let's try again. Okay, uh, if you have not, click here. Okay, so I've got my user login um, logged in here. If you were signing up and you didn't already have um, a uh, login, you would press down here and you would register so that you could log in. Otherwise, if you've already been signed up before, you can just log into your account. So we're gonna go log in. 
And then we get to this uh, kind of section, this home page. Um, when we're going to register for the GRAM application, we're going to go over here and click register certain groups of published work. So over here on the left, we have all the different applications. As you can see, um, there's a group of unpublished works, with the, which is the other application I talked about, um, one work by one author. Um, so there's those ones there as well. And then we've got the standard application over here. But for purposes of this webinar, we're going to look at the gram. So we'll click that. It gives you um, an overview and, and they've actually done this application really well in terms of instructions along the way, which is great. Um, but as you can see here, you can register up to 20 musical works or up to 20 sound recordings um, published on the same album, including any photos, artwork or liner notes first published with the album. So that's on the sound recording start, um, side, sorry. So start registration. This is where you would then pick what you're registering. Um, let's do the musical work first. So musical work from an album is down the bottom here. And as you can see, sound recordings from an album is the very last one. So we'll go to musical works from an album first. It's gonna give you a, de a description of um, what this uh, particular work needs to be in order to qualify. I recommend always reading these again, if you're not familiar with the copyright registration system to make sure that uh, the work that you're registering does still qualify and is eligible. So once you've made sure that it does, you're going to click that you agree and that you understand that it meets the eligibility requirements and then click continue. Um, for purposes of this, I'm gonna go into an application that I already saved so that I don't have to input all of uh, the information again. So let me pull that one up. Okay, so we were here. We're then gonna go continue musical works from an album. The very first step is to put in the album title. So you would click new, and then it's going to bring you to this screen here. And you would type in the album title, the date of publication, nation of first publication, label if there's a label involved. Um, was, the was the album released as a digital album? Was it released as a physical product, year of completion, and the actual number of works being registered? So this would be how many tracks are on the album. Um, I'm, I've just put in two here um, for purposes of keeping it simple. So we're gonna go to save, and then you would click new again in order to input the specific track titles. Um, so as you can see here, I've got one, and then the title of this work I've just put as track one. So again, we're gonna go save, and you would repeat that process until all of the tracks that you're trying to register on the album are within the system. Um, once you've got them all registered in there, so we've only got two for, for this um, particular album, uh, we're gonna go continue. This next page is where you put in the information about the authors. So you, you would go to new to add an author and you'll end up at this screen. So you add in all of the um, author information, or if it's an organization, you could put in the organization information. And then down here, you're going to either click that this um, is the uh, author who co-created or created all of the musical works. So if it's your common author, or if it's the only author on the album, um, you would click that. If they're not, then you're going to put in the tracks that they uh, co-created or that they co-worked um, on. For purposes of this, we're going to say, okay, this is our common um, co-creator. They created everything and we're going to go save. And then you'll add in your other authors on all of the songs. So again, you could put in the track number if that's what was relevant. For purposes of this, let's just assume that um, there's two authors who wrote the composition and they're both um, the co-author on all of the songs. They did all of the songs together. We'll click save. And then you go to continue. So this is where you put in the claimant information. So remember, um, it's really important to know that the claimant for all of the songs on the album must be the same. Um, you can't have, uh, you know, if you had two singer songwriters on one song um, and they wanna co-claim, uh, uh, co-own the copyright 
for um, one of the songs on the album, you're going to have to separate that out, unfortunately, and do a whole separate application. The claimant must be the same person for every single thing or the same two people on every single song. Um, unless we have some sort of assignment that's taken place. Um, and so in that uh, situation, there has to be something in writing. Um, and for any of the artists on the call, if you're dealing with this, I highly recommend speaking with an attorney to help you through to make sure you have all of the um, information. Um, but for the attorneys who are on the webinar, an example could be maybe the co-writer assigns um, the copyright to the other writer. And so that way there's only one claimant. Um, another example could be that a publisher is involved and the publisher has all rights um, to the copyright and there's some sort of agreement, publishing agreement in place that sets that out. Um, on the sound recording side, of course, similarly, we would have a label who has all rights um, or we could have band members. And so um, often we have band members who have an LLC. And in that case, they um, may be all the authors and they may be different authors on each of those songs. But at the end of the day, they're all transferring all rights and the copyrights over to that. LLC rather than individually holding them. With publishing as well, it's really important to know that the two songwriters on the song, they can't have um, different publishers to then uh, maybe one of the other songs. So you couldn't put that publisher um, down if they're not the publisher for all of the authors um, because they wouldn't have all of the exclusive rights. So once we have a, our claimants in here, um, I've just put in this particular situation that both author one and author two are the claimants um, and we're gonna go continue. This page is to uh, limit the claim. And so if the artist has uh, any pre-existing work that they're registering, um, they can exclude it. Uh, if there is public domain, um, music that's been included, they should exclude it here. If there is any samples, and of course the samples should be cleared, right? Um, they would also exclude it here. If there's nothing to exclude on the particular song and you can put in um, the different tracks as well. So you can say track five pre-existing melody um, and then put that information in here. Let's assume in this situation, we don't have any pre-existing work, no samples were used, no um, public domain work was used. And so we're just going to go to continue. This next one has to do with rights and permissions. So um, an individual should be listed here so that the US Copyright Office can get in touch with them if there's any issues with their application. We've just put author one here. They're going to be the um, rights and permissions. And sorry, not the um, US uh, Copyright Office. That would be if somebody was looking to get in touch about the copyright who was a third party. Then this next one is the correspondent. And so that's where it would be whoever the US Copyright Office needs to get in touch with if there is an issue. If an attorney was doing this, um, if I'm doing this for my clients, I would be putting my information in here so that the Copyright Office can contact me. If you're an artist, you would just be putting your own details in here so that they can contact you if they have any problems. Then we have to do the mail certificate. And a lot of this is pretty repetitive information, um, but this one is where the, the uh, actual certificate, um, once it's registered, is going to be sent. So you can put that address in there. Just be aware with this um, system, it is public information. So you probably um, wanna use a PO box if you have privacy concerns. Next page, we get to special handling. Um, really, there's very limited circumstances where a person who's registering their work would need to um, register and expedite their process. It does cost $800 to do this. Um, and so you wanna make sure that if you're doing it, you're doing it um, for a legitimate reason and that you actually have to do it. Um, pending or prospective litigation is one if there's a customs matter um, or if there's some sort of publishing deadline or contract deadline that's in place that uh, the registration needs to get um, kind of fast forwarded and, and expedited, then this would be where you would put that information in. 
And then this very last one, uh, the person who's doing the application will have to certify that everything in the application is true. So it's important to make sure that you review the application properly and know that everything that you've put in there um, is not false or a misrepresentation. If you have samples in your songs, do not um, put in here that you don't have any uh, cleared set or that you're not using samples or that you have cleared things when you haven't. And then this very last page, uh, we go on to a review of the application. So you'd wanna make sure that you have everything in there um, that's um, clear, make sure everything's spelt correctly, your addresses are correct. And then you would click add to cart. And then we have this here, we're gonna to go to checkout. And then you're gonna pick the way that you would like to pay. Um, I'm not going to go through and actually, um, you know, press this, but I am going to show you I've got a PDF um, document here. So let me pull that up so that I can show you what this next kind of section looks like. And I am going to provide this. I'll uh, get the Austin Bar to send this out. So this is step-by-step -step process for anybody that would like it, um, where you can follow these steps that we've just gone through um, through the US Copyright Office for the GRAM application. So let's go all the way down to the end, to the payment section. This is what you're going to get to. You're gonna put in your credit card details. You're gonna confirm everything and you're gonna click pay. Now it's really important to know that submitting your work comes after you pay. Um, I remember when I first used the US copyright system, I didn't wanna click pay because I felt like I hadn't uploaded um, the things that I needed to upload first, um, but it is after you pay. So once you've paid, you're going to get this upload section and you can upload the MP3s, um, or if you have sheet music, you could upload the sheet music into the system. Um, you're gonna start the upload. Once they're all completely full, you're going to submit them. And once they are submitted, you're going to get uh, an email confirmation from the US Copyright Office. You'll actually get two emails, one that says that you paid, and then another one that says that uh, the um, actual songs were received by them within their system. Okay, so we've done all of that. That was the music uh, composition side of things. So now we've got to remember with the gram application, you're going to have to go in again and repeat that process. But on this very first page, you're going to want to click sound recordings for an album and put in all of the necessary information and repeat everything that we just did. Um, obviously, if there's different owners, you're going to put in the different names for the sound recording, but it is um, essentially that same application process. You're just changing the type of work. And with the sound recording, you can also upload those um, uh, liner notes and artwork if you are the owner in them, um, of course. So I've got some questions here. Um, let me stop share for a minute and get to them. Okay. Um, somebody asked, I'm confused about the musical works from an album versus the sound recordings from an album. Can you please clarify? Yeah. Um, so with a song, we have two copyrights. We have the composition, which is the music, the lyrics, the beats. And then we also have a separate copyright that can be registered for the masters. So that's the sound recording. So that's why with this gram application, you have to go in and register both separately. Um, as I said, with some of the other applications, you don't have to do that. But with this gram application, you do. So there's two copyrights in every, um, every song. Um, and there may be even more than that, because there may be multiple masters, right? So that's why it's separate. Um, somebody says, I've written a book of 80 songs, how do I copyright the book of songs? So if it's, um, so you'd want it, you'd be talking about musical um, compositions. You probably want to reach out to an attorney to help you with that, um, just to see what the best application would be. A lot of the time it's um, kind of assessing uh, which is going to be best money wise uh, in order to know which one to use. Ryan says, does a band qualify as an organization if the band is registered as an LLC? Would that then qualify as an organization? Yeah, potentially. So you could have band members with this gram application who wrote 
on um, different songs, right? Uh, maybe they didn't all write all of the songs, but then what they do is they assign that copyright to the LLC. And so if there is a um, operating agreement for that LLC that says that the songs are assigned when they're created, or they sign something subsequent to the creation in order to assign it to the LLC, then yes, that band LLC could be the claimant. And this application would be really helpful in that situation because you could have those different authors listed on the different songs. So the different band members listed differently. Um, why would it be more beneficial to use this, which requires publication rather than trying to protect the work by registering it even before it has been published? Yeah, really good question. And this really is, um, an assessment of um, what's going to be best for the client when they bring you um, their works. And if they aren't published, then you're definitely going to want to look at that group of unpublished works because it's going to be less expensive, $85 for both sides. Um, but if it's already published, then you don't have that unpublished application. But you definitely can you know, encourage clients to maybe register groups of unpublished works before they publish them um, in order to take advantage of those lower fees and doing that one application rather than both sides. Um, if you had a cover song on an album that is otherwise or one writer, could you register the album minus that one cover song? Um, in that situation, you'd probably just want to exclude the material, I would think, in the registration. Um, Bob, so in 14 years, are you renewing registration? No, you don't need to renew um, copyright registrations. And so um, the copyright lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years, except for those other work for hire exceptions that um, I talked you through. It was once 14 years, but it's no longer 14 years. Um, that was the old law when it originally came into effect. Okay, if we have instrumental versions of songs, that are not included on the physical copy of the album and have their own ISRC codes, can they be included in the same application? So you have instrumental versions of the songs that are not included on the physical copy. So they have to be, the definition of the album comes into play here with the gram application. And so um, if you release them as one group, then they could be registered. If you didn't, uh, if you didn't um, register them, um, I mean, if you didn't release them as one group or one collection, then you couldn't register them all in the same application. You would, in that instance, have to do separate applications for them. Uh, B, for the Gram application, could you clarify whether there can be an owner of the group of sound recordings versus ma and masters? the band's label LLC, that is different from the owner of the group of the compositions, almost everything, they can be separate. So because they're two separate applications, that is the benefit. Um, you could register the group um, of musical compositions and have the publisher as the claimant and then do the separate application for the sound recording and have the label or the, the band's LLC um, as the claimant for that separate master um, sound recording application. So yeah, you, they don't have to be the same claimant in that situation, it could be different. Any other questions? Feel free to talk to me too. It's always very quiet on these um, virtual webinars. I feel like I'm talking to myself sometimes. Aaron, you missed my question. Do you wanna repeat it? There were some, um, how would you register the artwork slash liner notes on the album if the artist who created the work maintains ownership of the copyright, but is licensing? Okay, so in that situation, you wouldn't be able to register it because you're not the owner of all of the rights. You've only got um, a license in the artwork. So you wouldn't be able to register it. Um, the person who created the artwork and still has ownership, they could go ahead and register it separately, uh, but you as the licensee could not register it in that situation um, because you're not the owner. If you had a work for hire agreement with the artist, then you could, um, but not, uh, not if they're just licensing it. 
Uh, will this video be available? Yes, I have recorded it. Um, so I will be putting it up on the Austin Bar database as well as our Aslaba um, YouTube page. Um, I do want to just take a minute um, and talk about um, Tala and thank them for um, joining us with this webinar um, and supporting us. Um, for those of you who don't know Tala, if you're an attorney, you can volunteer with them uh, in order to provide services to artists who need legal help or accounting help if you're an accountant. Uh, and um, if you are an artist that's on the call and you are in need, of accounting or um, legal help, then you can sign up through their services. Uh, they have a membership per year and you get access to an attorney or an accountant um, for the whole year. Uh, so it's a really great resource for, for those artists that qualify for their services. Uh, what is the YouTube account? If you type in a slava into YouTube, um, you should be able to find us. So E-S-L-A-B-A. Great. Well, thank you. We're right on time. If there's no other questions, um, I will let you go unless there's anybody else have any other questions. Um, how does one handle an album which contains some original and traditional works, traditional works being newly arranged? Um, so that may be, I, I'm assuming in that situation, there's some works that have already been registered or have they are they still being released as an album? You might want to reach out to somebody for some help on that question. I think I need a little bit more information. Some public domain. Yeah, if it's public domain, you can just exclude it in the limitation. Um, so there was that page. And I'm going to send out uh, these instructions as well that I put together. Um, that'll go out in an email. So you'll be able to kind of see instructions for the applications as well. Perfect. Well, thank you all for joining us. It's great to see um, some of your face, some familiar faces. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you for joining. Have a great day.